glad that you're here worshiping with us this morning. If you are watching with us online, we are so glad you're here paying, tuning in with us. We invite you to come next week. We'd love to see you in person. If you're here in person for the first time, we'd love to get to know you. If you could stop by the information center, we have a free gift for you just by way of saying thanks for letting us know that you're here. I'm Pastor Doug Schneider. It's my privilege to serve as the pastor of Outreach and Connections here at Woodlands Church, and we have a very exciting service for us this morning. We have 14 people who have made the decision to take the next step in obedience to Jesus through baptism. Seven in this service and seven in the earlier service. That'll happen in just a little while. That'll happen in just a little while, and in the meantime, we wanna let you know some things going on here ne starting next Sunday over the next couple of weeks. So first of all, is our Feed Portage County collection is next Sunday, December 3rd. So we encourage you to stop by the Information Center, grab a, a list, a shopping list of some things that we need to help support the Backpacks for Hope program, the Salvation Army, and the Hmong Food Relief program that we have here in Portage County. So if you do that, that would be great. That list is also available on the digital bulletin. And then next Sunday at 3 p.m. is our annual Christmas carol sing. It's a way to kick off the season. We invite you to come on out in the chapel at 3 p.m., sponsored by the Senior Fellowship. It's an opportunity to sing those great songs that we know and think a little bit more about the season that we're entering into. And then finally, next Sunday, we kick off our Christmas series called Christmas Lights. And there'll be a four-part series leading us right up to Christmas Eve. We really invite you and encourage you to be here in person for all four of those sessions. It'll be a sweet time together as the body of Christ growing and preparing to worship our Lord Jesus as, he, as we're reminded of his entering into our dark world for our sake. Let's pray together as we prepare to hear from God's word. Father, thank you that you have entered into our world, that you know us and you love us beyond our wildest imagination. You have made yourself known to us throughout the history of the world through the revelation of your interaction with your people and having that written down in your word as we prepare our hearts this morning, Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to not only hear your word, but to understand it as John brings it to us. We give you praise in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Feels weird not singing first, doesn't it? Yeah. Like, uh, it's something like, it feels like our bodies aren't moving yet, right? You feel that way? <laughs> Y'all are afraid, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead and stand up for me. Got to get our, we need to get some blood moving. There you go. The first service didn't believe me when I said it. They just sat there and I was like, no, I'm serious. Come on. <laughs> Come on. So, uh. We're gonna like not, we're not gonna sing, but we're gonna like, we just need to move. So kind of like get, get a side to side going here. Come on, come on, it's okay. And some of you aren't moving yet, I see it, it's okay. Now, now that you're doing it, you kinda gotta, come on. Come on guys, get going. You feel the energy? Yeah. I don't have anything else to do, I just wanted to do this with you guys. All right, have a seat. Yeah, you feel good, waking up a little bit. Today's a fun service. I love baptism services because we get the chance to see life change. We get the chance to see a, a representation of someone who goes from death to life, uh, slave to free. This is a beautiful, beautiful thing. In fact, as we do this, think about your own baptism story, your own story, uh, testimony of your relationship with Jesus Christ. And we get a chance to remember that together. Uh, some of you may have been baptized when you were kiddos. Some of you may have been baptized later on. Some of you maybe haven't taken that step yet. Maybe this is a time to think about that. But what an opportunity we have today, right? To think about, to celebrate this beautiful thing called baptism. And this morning we're going to finish in a series in the book of Acts. We've been going through the first part of Acts to look at the church and say, what did the church look like in the early days? What did it look like in the first century, in the infancy of the church? We looked at different characteristics, and the, the name of the series has been the fill-in-the-blank church, and for each of us, we probably have some experiences that we would create as adjectives there. Uh, there. We would describe, this is what the church looks like, feels like for me. So going back to the first century church to see what it looks like, it should look like, helps us to think about what do we want to look like. 
And when we talk about the church, and sometimes I'm afraid that when I say the church, you think about an entity or a place or a time. Um, we are the church, right? Remember that thing you used to do? I used to do this as kids. This is the church. This is the steeple. Remember that? The church is the people. The church is us. Bound together by the Holy Spirit, the relationship we have with Jesus Christ, we are the church. And so this morning, we're going to finish this, and I'm really excited about this particular message. In fact, normally when I write a kind of notes and stuff, I have about six pages worth of, or eight pages worth of stuff, sometimes nine. Uh, I only have six today. Thanks for not cheering. Um, <laughs> the first service cheered there. Can you imagine? It hurt my insides. Anyway, um, because this message was actually really hard for me to put down on paper. It's, it's kind of a personal message. Uh, it's personal to me in my own personal journey. Uh, and I actually feel like it's personal to Woodlands too. That's why you're the, in the outline it's the Woodlands is. It's really, I want us to talk about us a little bit. And it's about the healing church. Kind of if you want to go back to the beginning of Acts, the things we've learned in this series is that we have the new church. The church is a church that's on mission, right? We're to go and make disciples of all nations, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that we commanded. We get an opportunity to be on mission. We're not a cruise ship. We're a battleship. We're out to do the mission that God's called us to do. We're led by God's word, empowered by the Holy Spirit to do those things. Apart from the Holy Spirit, I have no idea how we would be able to bring the, the message of the gospel to the nations or to even care and love one another. We need the Holy Spirit, and the body is infused, is empowered by the Holy Spirit that dwells within each and every one of us. We're ignited. We're an ignited church that the church was brought into being, and, and people came to know Christ early on when the, when the Holy Spirit happened. Uh, it's a devoted church. We're devoted to one another devoted to caring for one another, devoted to unity, devoted to prayer. We're a devoted church towards one another. A church that ministers and meets needs in a courageous church. I can't imagine what, how to live the Christian life without courage, can you? We want to be a praying church. The first century church, they prayed not that God would remove the obstacles in front of them, but that God would give them the courage and boldness to minister in the face, to speak the name of Jesus in the face of opposition. Because that opposition, they're not enemies, they're our mission field. They're the opportunity to share the gospel. Last week, Dave talked about the dis disciplined church, that God disciplines those he loves. And the church was disciplined with Ananias and Sapphira. And today, we're going to talk about the healing church. The church is a church of healing. So let me pray. God, we pray that you would teach us today. As we get into your word and as we get a chance to even see this in baptism, Lord, give us hope and in, in, in a, in a peace knowing that you are the great healer. That we don't have to come with it all put together, but that you want us to come with all of our afflictions and wounds. Teach us this today. In your precious name, amen. Turn to Acts 5.12. This is right after Ananias and Sapphira, and this is right before more persecution that's gonna come. Verse 12. Now, many signs and wonders were done regularly among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of them, none of the rest dared to join them, but the people held them in high esteem. You see, nobody really wanted to join the apostles. They're going out in public. They're in Solomon's portico, which is a very public place, but nobody wants to join them. Most likely, they could, have been afraid, they could have been afraid of what happened with Ananias and Sapphira, right? Just recently, two of their number lied against the Holy Spirit, and they died. That would be scary, right? Also, if you remember pre previously, 
the apostles were threatened and warned not to speak the name of Jesus in public. Most likely, that's a little bit what's happening here, happening here is that people are afraid to appear to have joined these people because they're afraid of the persecution that is going to follow. In fact, in the, in the chapters and verses after this particular story, you have the apostles being imprisoned. And so very likely, they're just afraid. But even in the midst of fear, even while they're afraid, people are coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Verse 14. And more than ever... Believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns of Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits. And they were, what's that word? Healed. Here's the picture. Here's what I know about this first century church experience that was happening. Number one, they stayed on mission. They continued to speak boldly the name of Jesus. They didn't go into a room and just be quiet and talk about what they learned about from Jesus or what they learned from one another. They went out into the portico, into the public, and they stayed on mission for Jesus. They continued to share the good news of the gospel. Number two, the afflicted and the sick came to the church. It's interesting to me that this ministry of the apostles, this ministry of the early church, looks very similar to the one that Jesus did. If you think back to the different stories of Jesus, he comes heals, people believe, comes, heals, people believe. This pattern of healing. And here the church, from the culture's standpoint, is known, is known as a place of healing. It's not necessarily known as a place where you can come, you have to have it all together to be there. People come with their wounds on their outside. Think about it. They, they have people who are coming that are lame. They can barely walk. You have people that are coming that are blind or deaf. Maybe there's people that come with, with, with um, leprosy or those sorts of things. And you have the church and people are coming to the church with their afflictions, not already cleaned. Here's something I know about the church of today. The same things are true. Number one, we will see people come to know Jesus if we stay on mission, right? Number two, this church, the church, should be a place where you can bring all your afflictions and wounds. You know, some of us may have grown up where you think that the church is a place where you need to look good. Anybody do that? Anybody grow up that way? where you feel like you have to be okay, you have to look okay to come to church. That's not the picture we have, is it? The picture we have of the early church is a church where the afflicted come for healing, not the healed come for more healing. That doesn't work. They're there because that's where they find healing. This is what it means to be the healing church. Have you ever been sick and you just needed relief? And it just felt like it would last forever and ever? There was this, um, this time that our family went to Disney World. And we saved up to go. It was a really fun experience. We, the kids were young. And so as parents, I just kind of dive into like Disney World. And so like we get, I get to be a pirate and like, arr, you know, and do all the fun stuff and have fun with the kids and go on the rides. And on our last day, we had a picture with a princess. Is that Anna? Is that Ella? Anna? Which one is that? Anna. Okay, y'all know. Okay. Very good. And we were, I mean, if you look at the picture, everybody's happy because this is the happiest place on earth except for one person. Do you see it? <laughs> that guy. That's young Samuel. He's probably four years old. And if you look closely, he's not doing good. 
That is not the happiest person on the face of the earth right now. And that poor kid, here's what happened. About a couple days earlier than that, we were on a ride, maybe Peter Pan or whatever, and we see, see Samuel start at the front of the line and lick the handrail, like, like go all the way down the handrail with his tongue. Just yum. And then it occurred to me, he's probably been doing this for a couple days now, just licking the handrail. Get it. And I'm not throwing any shade. He's four years old, okay? That's cool. You know, we like metallic tastes, but it is gross. Think of every single disease, ailment, or whatever, and that's why you had the face that you just saw. He got sick, like super sick. And this poor kid is throwing up starting about then. That night, we, we kind of saved a fancy dinner for that night, and here we are around this table, and everybody else in that room obviously also wanted a fancy dinner, but at our table, Samuel's throwing up in a bag during the middle of the dinner, and uh, they're like, we would like to give you to-go boxes. <laughs> we can tell you're having a hard time, and we want you out of here. I mean, it's, you need to leave. And we got to-go boxes. This was the start of an epic odyssey on our drive home for 18 hours. Because when one person, if, if you have a family, you know this. When one person gets sick, what happens to the next one? They get sick. So about Tallahassee, a couple more start to catch it. We're going back to Texas. By the time we get to Alabama, three out of the four kids, no, four out of four kids are down for the count. And they're just, I mean, if you saw why it was just a little guy, you know what happens when babies throw up? You just kind of aim them. Because <laughs> they can't do that. So the back of that van was unbelievable. It was like a Petri dish, okay? So here we are, we're in Mobile, Alabama, and we're trying to just like get some rest and everybody kind of can recoup, puke in a toilet for once. You know, luxuries. And um, so by three o'clock, everybody besides Catherine and I are totally going down. We can't stay in this hotel room any longer because every surface is covered with a towel where we've puked on. And we left at three o'clock and started driving home. We barely made it home before I got sick. This was a bad thing. And all we wanted was to be well again, right? If you've ever been there, all you want is to be well again. And I don't want to be judged for being sick because it's my son that lit the handrail, right? I want it to be okay for me to be sick because I want to be better now, before this, most everybody in our family were healthy, but we got sick. The reality of being sick is, or, or needing healing is sometimes healthy people need healing. There's this idea in our head that if you need to be healed, if you need healing, if, you need, if there's something broken or wrong, it's because you're an unhealthy person. That's not true. Healthy people sometimes get injured, right? Right? And the picture of the church is, is a place where you can go, warts, afflictions, sicknesses, and you can be safe to heal. You see, Woodlands is a healing church. Now, when I say that, what I want you to understand is what I mean is Woodlands is in the process also of healing. In this room, we have people who are suffering from long-standing depression, people who are suffering from broken relationships, damaged marriages, people who have sons and daughters and friends who are estranged. And if you're honest, and if I'm honest, those are wounds that need healing, right? In the last three years, there's been all sorts of opportunities for wounding, hasn't there? Even just generally in our country, we went through a season in a pandemic where I literally saw families broken apart over masks and vaccines. Maybe you experienced some of that. And those wounds exist, don't they? I saw a political season where there was strife and anger. I saw churches torn apart over politics. 
in our neighborhood. It was kind of, this was kind of funny, sad moment. Uh, there was a, one of my neighbors put up a sign, this is in Minnesota, a Biden sign, right? And across the street, the next day, guess what came up? A Trump sign. Normally, neighbors, these neighbors got along pretty just fine, but you could tell they were having some passive aggressive fun, right? The next day, that Biden sign was pulled up and a bigger Biden sign was there, <laughs> right? Guess what happened the next day with the other neighbor? That small Trump sign was out and the bigger Trump sign was up. And you started, like, then there were like three signs in this one and there were four. I mean, it was like, are we adults? You started to see fighting and bickering and wounds occur in division and disunity and to, to pretend that the last three years didn't create some residual effects on us is kind of like pretending that we don't have a sickness, right? Not pretending that we have, pretending that we have no wounds. Woodlands specifically went through their own wounding, haven't we? And to pretend that we haven't had these experiences is to pretend that we don't need healing. You see, Woodlands is in the process. You and I are also in the process of healing. And if you find yourself here at church and you say, I'm not, I'm still healing. I'm still struggling with depression. I'm still struggling with anxiety. I'm still struggling with fear. I'm still struggling with the things that kind of started during then. It's okay. Because this is a place where healing is happening. I feel like for me, personally, this is a place where healing is happening. So we're in good company together, right? Together at a healing church. One of, the, um, one of the fun things that I've seen too is that at this place, there is actually healing. I even think about my own journey and I think about, um, I even fear to come to this place and come to this community and serve at this church. There's this bit of, um, I don't know, Will it be different? Will it be a place where my family will be able to heal well? And, and I found that Woodlands is a place where healing happens. Woodlands is a healing church in the other way. Y'all think that's the same point, but it's not. Woodlands is a place where healing happens. In two days... I will hit my 90-day anniversary of being here at Woodlands. <laughs> hey! I'll tell you in 120 days, and we can clap again. It'll be awesome. Um, but here's the thing. Like, in 90 days, if you've ever been in a new job, you, there's like a 90-day review, right? And oftentimes, you, you watch in a 90-day review, and, a, and an employee gets a 90-day review. Well, you wouldn't know this, but I've been doing the same thing with you. I've been watching and I have my 90-day review for you. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> okay. Woodlands is a healing church. Here's some of the things I've seen. I've seen that Woodlands is a place where the hurting can find compassion. If you're hurting here today and you're, and you're feeling like there's no one that will care, the people at Woodlands care is a place where you can find true and genuine compassion. Did you hear that genuine part? Genuine compassion. Sometimes when you, when you, you get the Christian compassion that's a little bit fake, but people that genuinely care and are compassionate, Woodlands is a healing church well, this is a place of patience. It's a place where it's okay to take a little while for healing. Oftentimes we think that, okay, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna receive, like God's gonna just make it all together just like that, right? It just doesn't work like that. There's so much in scripture that talks about waiting on the Lord and there's something about being patient. And sometimes we're afraid that the people around us aren't gonna be patient with our own process of healing. 
Woodlands is a place where they're patient. Woodlands is a place of grace. You can mess up here. You can mess up here and you can find grace. We have a phrase in, on the staff team that I hear a lot, and you probably have used it too, but there's an umbrella of grace. It covers over everything. It's, just, it's, a, it's kind of a general way that we talk. It's okay. It's grace if you say something wrong. It's grace if you mess up a little bit. Um, it's grace just because we all need this grace, and we've all been given this grace. Woodlands is a place of grace. Woodlands is a place where people forgive each other. You can mess up and people not only show you grace, but will forgive you. Oftentimes we're afraid to interact with other people because we're afraid to kind of make them mad or afraid that we might mess up, but this is a place where people forgive. Woodlands is not a place of judgment. I love the picture of the first century church and how they weren't judging these people for coming in broken. In fact, it was common. The first century church likely didn't judge one another because they realized that they too walked in with a lot of wounds. I kind of picture the guy who comes in with, with leprosy, afraid to be judged about all the wounds on their body, and then another person in the church saying, oh, I used to have that too, right? I used to be a leper, but Jesus healed me. You see, when we come into this place and you're afraid that you might have, like, there's a stigma over a depression or an issue you're going on with your marriage or all of these things, what you can find here is someone who says, I've been there too. I've known what it was like. I know how it feels. That's the beautiful part of the church. This is a place where there isn't judgment. Every single affliction we can find here in this room, if we were to all yell them out, which we, I'm not saying we should, what you will find is someone else will share that with you. And some of us are a little bit further along in the healing and there's encouragement there, right? This is a place, of healing. Woodlands is a place of healing. It's a place that meets real needs. We have a care ministry with Jed and Laura. We have a, a trauma ministry to help people that are coming out of trauma. We have some tangible things like a movie ministry and carpenter's crew. We have all these different things that we want to care for people because Woodlands is a place of healing. But I want to just ask a question, Why? Why is this a place? Why is the church, and even in general, if the church is on mission, if the church is doing all the things that the church should be doing, if we are a church, why are we a church of healing? I could say, and I think this is true, I'm thankful for the healthiness of Woodlands Church. Just again, as a 90-day review, to me, to you, I look at a church that's extremely healthy. A church that's healthy could go through the last three years and be where we are today. Only a healthy church would, frankly. But why, are, why is Woodlands and why is the church a place of healing? Is it because all of you are great people? Some of you are like, I'm a pretty good person, yeah. And so, yeah, y'all are great. I love the people of Woodlands, but that's not why I think we're a healing church. That's not why I think the church is a healing place. Woodlands is all about Jesus. That's where healing comes from. That is the source of everything that we do is it's all about Jesus, amen? amen? Nothing else matters but Jesus. Remember, the apostles are doing exactly what Jesus did. They're mimicking his ministry. They're all about Jesus. In this church, Woodlands is all about Jesus and never always has been and will always be going forward. Is that okay with you guys? That is what we're about, Jesus Christ, because he is the great healer. He is the great physician. Colossians 1.15 talks about this Jesus. He says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers, or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. 
He created all things, which means he can fix all things. He was there before, he's here now as the great creator. Verse 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things are hold, are hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, he might be the first. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. You see, the reality is Jesus heals not just these things that we're experiencing now, but also our ultimate issue and our ultimate problem of sin. We're all in need of healing. All of mankind is broken as a consequence of sin. And he reconciles us through the blood of the cross. Verse 21, and you, that's us, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. You see, without Christ, we're broken. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless, put back together, healed and above reproach before him. This is the beautiful story of the gospel, the good news. Broken, enemies of God, in need of reconciliation. He so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him will not perish but have eternal life that we get a chance to be healed ultimately just from our sin, but also he heals those other wounds. In this room, I promise you, you're not the only one coming in with your afflictions. And the invitation that Jesus gives us in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 is so beautiful. He says, come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For some of you, you need to res this, this is a moment where you might need to respond to that invitation. To, to lay those burdens, lay those fears, anxieties, hurts at the foot of the cross. Maybe for you, it's the ultimate um, reality that you've never crossed that line of faith. You've never had that moment where you said, you know what, I believe. You're gonna see that depicted today in baptisms. I hope for, for some of us in the room, I hope it inspires us. The testimony of those is really the sermon of today, is really the message that I want you to hear. You see healing in the lives of the people because Woodlands is a healing church. It's a place where we are healing, yes, but it's also a place where you will find healing because of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege it is to be a part of your ministry. God, thank you that we do not have to come having fixed all the stuff in our lives. I thank you that we can come with our wounds and our pain. Lord, we're sorry that sometimes we, we hide all this. We hide it because we're, we're afraid of judgment. We're afraid of um, being vulnerable. And we can hide it from the people in the room or the people around us, but we can't hide it from you. And you know. Lord, when we, we seek you, we know that we will find peace. 
We can find forgiveness. We can find hope. Thank you for being patient. Thank you for being gentle and lowly at heart. Thank you that we can trade our heavy weight and our heavy burden, our heavy yoke. We can trade it for yours that is light. Lord, I pray for the people of Woodlands, for this community, that we would stay a place that is a healing church. Lord, as you write our story in the, in the years to come, Lord, I pray that our community will know that this is a place where you will find compassion, you will find forgiveness, you will find grace, that people will find Jesus lived out in our lives as a ministry and an example to a world that desperately needs you. It's hurting. So we give you this time, we give you this worship because you are worthy. It's in your master's name we pray these things. Amen. Let's stand together. Was wide, your arms were wider. 
Your grace was deeper, my shame was wide. Your arms were wider, my guilt was great. Your love is greater still. Your love was greater still. Amen. You may be seated. We have an exciting moment coming up. The Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the church in Galatia, writing to a bunch of people who have made the decision to follow Christ, wrote this. He said, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, there is neither slave nor free, nor, there, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ. The people who have made the decision to be baptized today are essentially saying that they are putting on Christ as their identity. They are taking off their old self. First and foremost, they are a follower of Jesus Christ. They recognize that Jesus is the Lord of all creation. And they follow him as Lord and Savior, choosing to obey and follow him above all else. Here at Woodlands Church, we practice child dedication, where we as parents and as a church congregation commit to praying for our children, raising them in the, the love of, and the admonition of the Lord so that they would understand God's incredible love for them through his word, through his presence. And then we commit to praying for them that the Lord would draw them into a relationship with Jesus Christ for no one comes to the Son unless the Father who sent the Son draws them. And so we pray, asking God to do a work in their lives, helping them to recognize their need to follow Jesus as Christ alone. And so we reserve baptism then for those who have made that decision, that profession of faith, an informed and conscious decision to worship God in Christ alone follow him all of their days it is only through receiving Christ Jesus his death on the cross that we can be called children of God that we can have a relationship with him and we can have our sins forgiven the Apostle John as he wrote in the Gospel of John says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God he was with God in the beginning and that God came to his own but his own did not receive him but to those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to be called children of God. Children born not of natural descent or human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Supernaturally, God adopts them when they recognize their need for him, receive him for forgiveness, and ask to be his child. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome in chapter 10 saying, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And he wrote to that same church early, earlier in chapter 6 where he said, we were therefore buried with Christ through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may be raised to newness of life. So baptism is a beautiful word picture of being buried with Christ having our sin put to death and being raised to newness of life. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever, I don't know that you have, I haven't. But imagine with me if you have ever seen somebody literally who had died and raised from the dead, what would your response be? Let that be our response this morning as we recognize that these folks have literally died. Christ says you were dead in your transgressions and sins, but by his mercy you're given new life. And as they raise up out of the water, let's celebrate that newness of life. Amen? Amen. Raphael, have you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins? And is it your commitment to follow Jesus in all of life, for all of life? Then it brings us great joy. Having heard your testimony and profession of faith, it brings us great joy to baptize you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Amen. Um, my relationship with Jesus really began when a really close friend of mine, Lauren Johnson, um, asked me to come to youth group with her, and I gladly accepted that, and that was kind of a turning point in my faith. It allowed me to really connect with God and really connect with a community of Christians that allowed me to grow my faith, and um, I guess I used that opportunity to grow my faith and grow that fire in my heart that people see today. Um, and. During that period, I was thinking on a Wednesday night, I really hope that something from tonight's youth group lesson applies to me and applies to my life. And that night, the lesson was about relationships with other people and as well as God. And then also that night, they presented the opportunity to get baptized. And I believe that me getting baptized will allow me to continue growing my faith and becoming a person who kind of lives in God's image, and that's something that I would really like to do. Mackenzie, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. And do you commit to following Jesus in all of life, for all of life? Yes. And it brings us great joy, having heard your testimony and profession of faith, to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm Dave Stelton Bowl, and I'm here to get baptized. As a young boy, I was baptized in a Lutheran church. I wandered for years. It took me nearly a lifetime to realize that I couldn't clean up my life enough to please God. But when I was lost, He found me. I was a taker, and He made me a giver. When I was in despair, He gave me hope. In the rough times, I felt unlovable, but he showed me his unconditional love. When times were dark, he gave me his life. He showed me I was an imitation, and then he made me real. I was alone, and he gave me his family. And last, Dave, have you put your trust and faith in Christ Jesus alone for the forgiveness of your sins? And is it your commitment to follow Jesus in all of life, for all of life? And having heard your testimony and profession of faith, it brings us great joy to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. My journey started as a little girl around age 10 at a summer Bible camp during a campfire service. I spent my teen and young adult years striving to be good enough, knowing that I wasn't, how unworthy and undeserving I was. I wish I could say one day the clarity of salvation hit me, um, but that would be incorrect. There were years of falling away, God calling me back to his unconditional forgiveness, whispering mercy and grace to my heart. Through the ups and downs of marriage and raising a family, Romans 8.28 was the verse I held on to. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. I can now look back and see God taking my sin and the broken pieces of my life and making something beautiful. I'm encouraged every time I read the Old Testament about God's chosen people and great men wandering away and then God lovingly calling them back forgiving them and extending grace where it was never warranted. For me, it was a precious moment of rest when I realized there's nothing I can do to earn this amazing gift of salvation, only accept it. Thankfully, through it all, God has brought me to this place today. 
For a long time, I didn't see baptism as necessary, but like much of my journey, I've come to realize this is another step in obedience to Him, and I'm thankful and blessed to be here. Praise God. Man, have you put your faith and trust in Christ alone for forgiveness of your sins? And do you commit to following Jesus in all of life, for all of life? And having heard your testimony and your profession of faith, it brings us great joy to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Hello, my name is Nick Fisher. I've decided to get baptized. Um, growing up, I went to church and knew what the Bible was and what it taught. I believe God existed and was the creator of all things. I even asked God to save me when I was eight and then later be baptized. It wasn't until a couple of years ago, though, that I came to realize that what I thought was true in me being saved was just head knowledge. I had no relationship with God in my day-to-day -day life. I was too focused on worldly things like partying and wanting to fit in with the crowd. While I was in Japan for the military, I started to do a lot of growing up and questioning things more. I would feel God pushing me to go to church again. I would go now and then, but in between that, I would still be partying and acting the same way. It wasn't until I moved back to the States when I moved to Minnesota that God would really work on me. For the first year that I lived there, I would continue the same and not change my lifestyle. In the next year after having met my wife, God used her to encourage me to go to church. I decided to go to church the next week. After going for a couple weeks, the pastor had a sermon that God really used to move me. He was preaching about Sodom and Gomorrah, and when Lot and his family left the city, they were not to look back or stop or otherwise they would be killed. He said Lot surrendered himself to God, so even when God said to leave the only place he knew and not to look back, he obeyed. We need to do the same as Christians. Don't look back on our old lives because what God has ahead of us is far much better. So we need to trust him. Lot's wife didn't listen though. She didn't trust God. She looked back and turned into the salt pillar. It's the same way for us. God told us what is going to happen at the end. We need to trust him and accept his salvation from hell. Surrender ourselves to him and what he has for us to do. If we do not trust him like Lot's wife did, then our fate will be the same as hers. Amen. Nick, have you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins? And do you commit to following Jesus in all of life, for all of life? And having heard your testimony and profession of faith, it brings us great joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My story begins similar, probably to how a lot of yours does. I was raised in a Christian home by two loving parents who just wanted me to know Jesus. And because of that, I was baptized as an infant and went to church most every Sunday and Sunday school and Bible class and youth group and all the things that church kids did growing up. Um, but moving towards middle school and high school was really where my faith became my own. Um, I had a youth pastor growing up if there's one thing that I wish I knew when you're when I was your age was that Jesus wants a relationship with you and so I was able to have that um, as I was a younger and going through high school um, headed to college I was so excited because I knew that I really wanted to be a teacher that was what I wanted to do and I was also excited to pursue my faith along the way um, but then early on in my freshman year of high school my mom passed away and so I was facing this struggle of like I want to be at home with my family but I also want to be a teacher and in order to do that I need to be at college and in students point and so finally just through a lot of prayer I felt God telling me that I needed to stay in Stevens point and so because of that I got more involved in crew and coming to Woodlands and uh, in Bible study with really good friends and so I was able to just really dig deep into that community here as well. Um, headed towards college graduation, I had spent so much time wishing college away that I was ready to be done. And so, 
because of that, I applied to a job in Wisconsin Rapids, and I got it, and so I'm living in Stevens Point now, and just continuing to grow in my faith in a Bible study with some of my best friends, and serving on a worship team at Woodlands, and just being plugged in and continuing to pursue my faith. And so that brings us here today, where I am getting baptized on my own decision, not a decision that my parents made for me, but making that public declaration of my faith in Jesus. Amen. Allison, have you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins? And do you commit to following Jesus in all of life, for all of life? And it brings us great joy having heard your testimony and profession of faith to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I am here to get baptized for the first time. Um, I grew up with little to no religion, um, and I never knew how to start, how could I start, and my family went through many rough patches this year, and um, I felt like I was just ready to give up. And there was just so much weight on my shoulders. On Easter Sunday of this year, my boyfriend told me to go to Woodlands with my kids. So we did, best decision of my life. Um, Woodlands helped me find what I have needed for years. This, my baptism, my outward expression of faith. I just wanna thank you for all your support and I thank God for the courage and guidance he has given me. Yeah. Brittany, have you put your trust and faith in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins? And do you commit to following Jesus in all of life, for all of life? Then it brings us great joy, having heard your testimony and profession of faith, to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Woo! we continue in worship.
to his name. Our God and our Father is so gracious. Let's pray together and then receive a benediction from the Lord. Our God and our Father, we are so thankful that you reached into our dark world. You did not leave us helpless and abandoned to figure out life on our own, to grope in the darkness trying to figure out what it's all about. But you chose us, in fact, before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in your sight, and though we were anything but holy and blameless, you stepped into our world, into our lives. You drew us to the Son, and you paid for our sin, our debt on the cross, putting our sin to death, that it would no longer rule and reign over us, that it would no longer separate us from you, adopting us as your very own and raising us to know you, to love you, You've met each of us in different places, in different stages of life, in different times. And you've brought us into the newness of life. We give you thanks and praise for that. I ask, Father, that you'd protect each one here who have made that decision. To trust you in baptism, to follow you and obey you. That you would guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That you would protect them from the evil one. Through the power of your word and your presence, that you would grow them up to be more like you, increasing Every day, their level of conviction over sin. And increasing every day, their joy in the things that bring joy to your heart. Help them find their joy in the things that matter most to you. Equip them for ministry and empower them for your service to do the works of service that you've prepared in advance for them to do. And we pray that you go with each of us as we receive this benediction from your word. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go on, enjoy this day in the Lord. Thanks for being here.